The bitter smell of gunpowder hung heavy in the air as First Lieutenant John B. Power clutched his bleeding stomach, his breath coming in ragged gasps. The din of battle raged around him, the rhythmic beats of machine gun fire, the thunderous explosions of mortars, and the desperate shouts of his fellow Marines. On this hellish February day in 1944, the fate of Namur Island hung in the balance. This tiny island stood as a daunting obstacle in America's island-hopping strategy. Its capture would shatter Japanese defenses in the Marshall Islands and open the path to the enemy's doorstep. But first, the Marines had to survive this crucible of fire and steel. Power's platoon was pinned down, caught in the crossfire of a Japanese pillbox that seemed impenetrable. Men were falling left and right, and the assault was stalling. Despite the searing pain from his stomach wound, Power knew what he had to do. He rose to his feet, his left hand pressed against his injury, while his right gripped his M1 carbine. Time seemed to slow as Power fixed his gaze on the pillbox. The 25-yard stretch before him might as well have been a mile, littered with debris and crisscrossed by enemy fire. His men watched in awe and horror as their lieutenant began his charge. Bullets whizzed past him, kicking up sand and fragments of coral. Power's world narrowed to the muzzle flashes ahead, his carbine blazing as he advanced. Platoon Sergeant Magnum would later recall the incredible scene, quote, He was like a one-man army. It seemed that he wanted to win the whole war by himself, right then and there. Power was a man possessed, driven by duty, and had an indomitable will to save his men and complete the mission. But as he neared the pillbox, the enemy fire intensified. The fate of Namur, perhaps the entire campaign, now rested on the shoulders of this wounded Marine Lieutenant, charging headlong into the heart of danger. As 1943 drew to a close, the vast expanse of the Pacific Ocean remained a chessboard where American and Japanese forces maneuvered for supremacy. The tide of war had begun to turn, but victory was far from assured. In the wake of the brutal Guadalcanal campaign and the bloody struggle for Tarawa, American planners set their sights on a new target, the Marshall Islands. The Marshalls represented more than just another dot on the map. They were a vital stepping stone in America's island hopping strategy, a campaign designed to leapfrog across the Pacific, bypassing heavily fortified Japanese strongholds in favor of strategically important but less defended islands. Admiral Chester W. Nimitz, commander-in-chief of the Pacific Fleet, knew that capturing the Marshalls would bring American bombers within striking distance of the Japanese homeland. The Gilbert and Marshall Islands campaign had begun in earnest with the capture of Macon and Tarawa in November 1943. These victories, while costly, had provided valuable lessons. The horror of Tarawa, where over a thousand Marines had fallen in just over 76 hours of fighting, shocked the American public and military alike. Marine Corps General Holland Smith later reflected, quote, Tarawa was a mistake. We should have bypassed it. The cost of taking it was too high. But from the blood-soaked coral of Tarawa came hard-earned wisdom that would shape the battles to come. As American forces prepared for their next move, the Japanese frantically bolstered their defenses in the marshals. Admiral Masashi Kobayashi, the regional commander based in Truk, had 28,000 troops at his disposal. However, the Japanese strategy was flawed. Their defenses were spread thin across the vast atoll chain, with most fortifications facing the ocean, not expecting an assault from the lagoon side. The 6th Base Force, under Rear Admiral Monzo Akiyama, formed the backbone of the Marshall Islands' defense, with key installations on Kwajalein, Roy Namur, Mili, Maloalap, and Watja. In the war rooms of Pearl Harbor in Washington, D.C., American planners crafted Operation Flintlock, an ambitious assault on multiple atolls in the Marshalls. The crown jewel of this operation was Kwajalein Atoll, the world's largest coral atoll and a key Japanese base. Rear Admiral Richmond K. Turner's 5th Fleet Amphibious Force and Major General Holland M. Smith's 5th Amphibious Corps were tasked with this monumental undertaking. The planning was meticulous. Learning from the costly lessons of Tarawa, the Americans planned for overwhelming force. 
The invasion force would include the battle-hardened 4th Marine Division and the Army's 7th Infantry Division, supported by a massive naval armada. The planners also incorporated new tactics, including improved naval gunfire support and the use of underwater demolition teams to clear beach obstacles. Quadraline Atoll, a necklace of coral and sand encompassing a massive lagoon, held immense strategic value. Its capture would provide the Americans with a forward base for future operations and deal a severe blow to Japanese defensive lines. As one American officer put it, quote, Quadraline was the key that would unlock the door to the Japanese inner defense ring. The atoll's geography presented both challenges and opportunities. Kwajalein Island in the south and the twin islands of Roy Namur in the north were the main objectives. The narrow width of these islands meant that once the Americans established a beachhead, the Japanese would have nowhere to retreat. However, this also meant that the defenders could concentrate their forces, potentially making every yard of advance a bloody struggle. As January 1944 dawned, the stage was set for one of the most ambitious amphibious operations in military history. Ships and men converged on the Central Pacific. The tension was palpable as final preparations were made. A young Marine, about to embark on his first combat mission, wrote home, quote, We're heading into the unknown, but we're ready. Whatever comes, we'll face it together. Among the thousands of Marines and soldiers preparing for battle was a young lieutenant from Worcester, Massachusetts, John Vincent Power. Neither he nor his comrades could have imagined what was in store for them on the sun-baked coral of Kwajalein Atoll, nor the acts of extraordinary courage that would unfold in the days to come. As the invasion fleet steamed westward, the fate of the Pacific War hung in the balance, with Kwajalein standing as the next critical test of American resolve and fighting prowess. As dawn broke on January 31, 1944, the calm waters of the Pacific were shattered by the thunderous roar of naval gunfire. Operation Flintlock had begun. The assault on Kwajalein Atoll was underway, marking the first American attack on pre-war Japanese territory. The invasion force was overwhelming. The 4th Marine Division, under Major General Harry Schmidt, was tasked with taking Roy Namur in the north, while the Army's 7th Infantry Division, led by Major General Charles H. Corlett, set its sights on Kwajalein Island in the south. Supporting them was a massive naval armada, including 12 battleships, 11 cruisers, and 79 destroyers, painting the sky with fire. As the Marines of the 4th Division approached Roy Namur, among them was 25-year-old officer First Lieutenant John B. Power. With his easy smile and quick wit, Power was a study in contrasts, a fun-loving spirit who had found his calling in the crucible of war. Born on November 20th, 1918, Power had grown up near the Cathedral of St. Paul in Worcester. He was a natural athlete, excelling in tennis, basketball, football, and golf at the College of the Holy Cross. His math professor, Reverend Joseph T. O'Callaghan, remembered him as, quote, a good and determined student. Little did either know that both would eventually be awarded the Medal of Honor for their actions in World War II. The Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor had changed everything for power. He enlisted in the Marine Corps Reserve on July 7, 1942, quickly distinguishing himself and earning a commission as a second lieutenant. His natural leadership abilities and unwavering dedication saw him rise to first lieutenant by August 31, 1943. Now, as part of Company K, 3rd Battalion, 24th Marine Regiment, Power found himself at the tip of the American spear. The assault on Roy Namur began with the capture of smaller islets to be used as artillery bases. Then, on February 1st, the main landing commenced. The scene that greeted the Marines was apocalyptic. Naval bombardment had transformed Roy Namur into a wasteland of shattered palm trees and cratered earth. Yet, from this devastation, Japanese defenders emerged, determined to fight to the last man. The Japanese defensive strategy on Namur presented unique challenges. Unlike on Tarawa, where defenses had been concentrated on the beach, the Japanese on Namur had prepared in depth. Concrete bunkers, pillboxes, and spider holes turned the island into a lethal maze. 
Power's platoon found itself in the thick of the fighting. As they pushed inland, every shell crater, every mound of debris could hide an enemy waiting to strike. The advance was measured in yards, each gained at a terrible cost. The Marines had secured a tenuous hold on Roy Namur, but the battle was far from over. The Japanese, though outnumbered and outgunned, fought with a ferocity born of desperation. They launched furious counterattacks under the cover of darkness, probing for weaknesses in the American lines. For Power and his men, exhausted from hours of brutal combat, the night brought little respite. They huddled in their foxholes, fingers tight on their rifles, straining to hear any sound of approaching enemy over the persistent crack of gunfire. As February 2nd dawned, Power knew the hardest fighting was yet to come. The Japanese were dug in deep, and rooting them out would require courage beyond measure. The island of Namur was a hellscape of shattered palm trees and smoking craters. The previous day's bombardment had transformed the once lush tropical paradise into a nightmarish battlefield. First Lieutenant John V. Power and his platoon from Company K, 3rd Battalion, 24th Marines, found themselves in the thick of the fight, pushing inland against fierce Japanese resistance. Power's men had a critical objective, to advance across the island and link up with other marine units to secure the airfield. But as they moved forward, they encountered a formidable obstacle, a Japanese pillbox that seemed impervious to their attacks. This reinforced concrete bunker, bristling with machine guns, dominated the approaches to the airfield and had already exacted a heavy toll on the advancing Marines. The situation was dire. Power knew that as long as the pillbox remained operational, his platoon's advance, and indeed the entire operation on Namur, was in jeopardy. Initial attempts to neutralize the position had failed. Rifle fire bounced harmlessly off its thick walls, while mortar rounds seemed to have little effect. Power, his youthful face streaked with dirt and sweat, assessed the situation. He called for a demolition team to take out the pillbox. As the demo men prepared their charges, Power made a fateful decision. Despite the extreme danger, he would personally assist in placing the explosives, hoping his presence would inspire his men and ensure the success of this crucial mission. As Power moved forward with the demolition team, the air around them erupted with enemy fire. Bullets whizzed past, kicking up coral dust and splintering what remained of the nearby palm trees. In that chaotic moment, as they neared their objective, disaster struck. A Japanese round found its mark, tearing into Power's stomach. The pain was excruciating, but Power refused to fall back. Pressing one hand against his bleeding wound, he shouted to his men, quote, keep going. His determination was infectious, spurring the demo team to complete their task despite the withering fire. But the demolition charge, while damaging the pillbox, failed to neutralize it completely. As power was pulled back to relative safety, he surveyed the scene before him. His platoon was pinned down, taking increasing casualties. The cries of wounded marines filled the air, mixing with the relentless chatter of enemy machine guns. At that moment, as he felt his own lifeblood seeping between his fingers, Powers made a decision that would echo through Marine Corps history. He knew that someone had to break the stalemate to inspire the men for one final, decisive push. Despite his grievous wound, despite the almost certain fate that awaited, Power decided that he would be that someone. He said to his platoon sergeant, Herbert B. Magnum, quote, You take charge, Maggie. I'm done for. But even as he spoke these words, Power was sealing himself for one last heroic act. He checked his carbine, took a deep breath, and prepared to do what no one else could do. As his men watched in awe and horror, First Lieutenant John B. Power rose to his feet, ready to charge into the teeth of the enemy defenses, determined to break the deadlock. In a moment that seemed to stretch into eternity, First Lieutenant John B. Powers rose from the relative safety of his position his face a mask of grim determination. Despite the searing pain from his stomach wound, he gripped his M1 carbine tightly and began his solitary charge toward the Japanese pillbox. Enemy fire erupted from the pillbox, stitching the ground with bullets, 
and filling the air with a lethal hail. Power's blood-soaked uniform clung to his body, a testament to the severity of his wounds. Each step sent waves of agony through his frame, but he pressed on, driven by an indomitable will. As Power advanced, he became a focal point for enemy fire. Bullets whizzed past his head, kicking up coral dust and debris around him. He stumbled over the uneven terrain, littered with shell craters and the detritus of battle, but each time he regained his footing and pushed forward. With his left hand pressed against his stomach wound, Power raised his carbine with his right, returning fire as he advanced. His shots were precise, born from months of training and the desperate intensity of the moment. Japanese defenders fell before his onslaught, their cries of alarm rising above the din of battle. As he closed the distance to the pillbox, Power's carbine ran dry. In a display of incredible courage, he paused in the face of enemy fire to reload. His bloodied hands fumbled with the magazine, every second an eternity, as bullets zipped past him. Power was now mere yards from the pillbox, his figure silhouetted against the smoke-filled sky. He raised his reloaded carbine, prepared to fire into the pillbox's firing ports when a burst of enemy fire struck him. Multiple rounds tore through his body, and First Lieutenant John B. Power fell, his final act of bravery etched into the minds of all who witnessed it. The impact of Power's sacrifice was immediate and profound. Inspired by their lieutenant's courage, the Marines of his platoon surged forward with renewed vigor. The Japanese pillbox, which had seemed an impregnable fortress, fell within minutes to the Marine assault. Sergeant Herbert B. Magnum, who had watched the entire scene unfold, later recounted, quote, He was like a one-man army. It seemed that he wanted to win the whole war by himself, right then and there. Magnum's words captured the essence of Power's incredible bravery and the awe it inspired in his fellow Marines. In those few heroic moments, First Lieutenant John B. Power had turned the tide of the battle under Moore. His sacrifice had broken the deadlock, allowing the Marines to complete their objective and secure the island. As news of his actions spread, Power's charge became a rallying cry for the entire 4th Marine Division, embodying the courage and sacrifice that would ultimately lead to victory in the Pacific. The Battle of Kwajalein concluded on February 3rd, with American forces securing the entire atoll. This victory, achieved in just four days, stood in stark contrast to the bloody, protracted struggle at Tarawa. The relatively swift capture of Kwajalein validated the new American tactics and boosted morale across the Pacific theater. Power's extraordinary actions did not go unrecognized. On August 30th, 1944, his parents stood in the White House as President Franklin D. Roosevelt posthumously awarded their son the Medal of Honor. The citation reads in part, quote, His exceptional valor, fortitude, and indomitable fighting spirit in the face of withering enemy fire were in keeping with the highest traditions of the U.S. Naval Service. He gallantly gave his life for his country. The nation sought to honor Power's memory in various ways. On June 30th, 1945, USS John B. Power, the destroyer, was launched. The Power family attended the launch of USS John B. Power at Bath Ironworks, Maine. As Mrs. Power christened the destroyer, champagne splashed on both the ship's bow and her dress, marking a solemn and proud moment. In his hometown of Worcester, Massachusetts, a bronze statue of Power was unveiled on November 2, 1947. Standing eight feet tall, the statue depicts the young lieutenant in his moment of greatest courage, eternally vigilant outside City Hall. Power's actions became a source of inspiration within the Marine Corps, embodying the values of courage, sacrifice, and devotion to duty. His story was recounted to new recruits, serving as a powerful example of the Marine ethos. Those who knew Power remembered not just his heroism, but his character. His Holy Cross professor, Reverend Joseph T. O'Callaghan, recalled him as, quote, a good and determined student, while his comrades spoke of his infectious humor and steadfast leadership. In military history, John B. Power's name stands alongside other great heroes of World War II. His sacrifice on that fateful day on Nemore Island 
encapsulates the courage and selflessness of an entire generation who fought to preserve freedom in the face of tyranny. Today, over seven decades later, Power's legacy endures. His story continues to inspire, reminding us of the profound cost of freedom and the extraordinary heights of human courage. In the words of his sister, Patricia Power Rose, quote, Jack was full of fun. Everyone called him Sunshine. Still, when it mattered most, he showed a courage that outshone the sun itself. <laughs>